632. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is our second week of our Can That I Trust the Bible series. So um, probably a few months ago, Joseph and I began to dream of this series and what we could do, and Zach opened it up last week. We're going to have Joseph take the reins or take over the baton, so to speak, tonight. And um, so I, what I want to do is just pray, and then we're going to have Joseph come on up and get started. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence here in this place. And thank you that you care about your word. Um, Lord, you care about your word uh, more than we do. And um, thank you for the meticulous um, effort and time that you took to write your word. Thank you for the partnership that you entered into with so many different writers over so many years. And Lord, thank you that the Bible has literally changed the history of this world. It's, it's easily the most important book in history. And um, thank you for everything you teach us through your word. So tonight, as we look to your word and we look and we consider if uh, it's trustworthiness, I pray that you would lead our hearts and lead our minds. And so we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up, Joseph. Amen. Oh, starting off great. Okay. Um, so this week, welcome to Can I Trust the Bible? Part two. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, mainly prophecy. That's that's our, that's our main focus today. We're going to look at some fulfilled prophecy. Um, so Zach did a really good job a couple weeks ago um, establishing the topic and, and giving us some definitions, some of the arguments for God, uh, and some, he, he mentioned some of the self-attestation in the Bible. Um, some examples of that are uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, and training in righteousness. Uh, Proverbs 35, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Hebrews 16, 18, so that by two things, uh, two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, lastly, Matthew 4.4, 4, these are the words of Jesus, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now these last two verses I want to focus on because today we are looking at fulfilled prophecy. Um, why are we looking at fulfilled prophecy? Uh, a few answers here. It proves that the message is from God. Um, only God could predict these things that are, that are coming in the future. Um, it guarantees the rest of God's promises. If God is faithful here, if he's able to predict what's going to happen and then make it happen, um, we can trust that he is going to do that in the future. And it sets the Bible apart from all other religious books. Um, no other text has been able to do th this. No other religious leader has been able to uh, make claims and, and consistently make claims um, and, and then them happen in the future without, you know, in, in many cases without any, with, without any ability of, of, of his own to, to force that to happen. Um, Pastor Ryan's in a course right now about Islam and uh, he, he mentioned to me recently uh, that, that his professor asked him how many, uh, how many of Muhammad's prophecies came true. And um, out of the, the many, many prophecies he made, uh, apparently only one uh, came true, and that, that he was going to take, take over Mecca, right? Um, and that was the only thing he predicted, and then it actually happened. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and, and we can look at Second uh, Peter 1, 20 through 21. Um, the, the Bible is claiming here that each, each one of these prophecies is directly from God. So, so if that's the case, um, 
These are examples of the author, God, uh, being, at least in these parts of the Bible, inerrant, without error. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And having knowledge of the future, um, which is evidence for him being omniscient. It's not proof, necessarily, but it does show that he has knowledge of these things, at least, um, which is evidence for omniscience, which, which means being all-knowing, right? Um, we're also going to look a little bit about the, uh, at the statistics for uh, the prophecies specifically regarding Jesus. Um, there are over 300 prophecies uh, about Jesus, and we're going to get into a little, little math, um, which will be really fun. Um, and, uh, and if we have time, we're going to get into a little bit about the, the evidence for the resurrection, um, which helps us once again to build a case for the author. And if the author, Jesus, is omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, which uh, is evidenced by him rising from the dead, that's all-powerful. If, uh, if he can rise from the dead, then, then he, he is, is likely all-powerful. Omnibenevolent, um, which means all-good, and uh, which is evidenced by, by him dying for our sins. And um, if he says his word is true, which he did many, many times. He affirmed uh, the scriptures. One example of that is Matthew 4, 4, which we just read. Um, then if, if all these things are true, omniscience, omnipotence, omnibenevolence, and him saying that it's true, well, then maybe it is. So let's, uh, let's jump into uh, some specific prophecies. Um, we're going to start in Ezekiel 26. Um, so you, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me there. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the NESB, but uh, what, whatever uh, version you have, you can go ahead and read out of that. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on this passage. This is predicting the destruction of the city of Tyre, the destruction and conquering of the city of Tyre. Um, Tyre uh, was an ancient city. Uh, it was known, of the, known as the Queen of the Sea, um, so it was a coastal city. Um, and it, it was a big trade hub, so ships would come in, and it was a trade hub for the area, um, and they also had a massive navy, and they were extremely well fortified. Um, uh, some sources say that it hadn't been conquered or, or breached for 2,000 years, um, and uh, the layout of the city of Tyre was interesting. It was uh, a coastal city, um, but it also had an island portion off the coast, so, so the city was broke up, broken up into two portions, the, the mainland city and then the island city, um, which, w but they were, they were both just part of the same city, and they were, they were extremely well fortified. They also had a massive navy, so it was extremely hard to breach the city itself, but especially the island city, um, and since the Tyrians could retreat to that island city if they ever were under siege, um, they... They were, they were pretty safe um, from, from that. Um, so let's start uh, in Scripture, starting in verse 1. Now in the 11th year, on the first month, first of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said in regard to Jerusalem, Aha, the gateway of the peoples is broken. It has opened to me. Um, I shall be filled now that she is laid waste. Um, I made these slides, and I'm, I'm reading from my notes because I have other things here. Um, so do you guys just want to tell me when to, when, when to switch the slides since I'm, since I'm switching them myself? Okay, great. Um, therefore, uh, verse 3, therefore, this is what the Lord God says. So these are the words of the Lord. This is the, um, the, the prophecy here. Behold, I'm against you, Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and tear down her towers, and I will sweep her debris away from her and make her a bare rock. Now let's start, stop there for a moment. Um, so in, what are we looking at, at here? Verses 4 and 5. Um, so I'm going to go back there. Um, in verse 3, uh, the Lord says, Behold, I'm against you, Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. A plain reading of this text uh, a plain interpretation would be many nations, many different cultures, many different times as the sea brings up its waves will come against the city of Tyre. So this will be a repeated thing that continues to happen. Um, I'm just addressing that now because it'll be important when we come to 
objections about this, this prophecy. Um, so we can continue on, uh, starting in verse 5. Uh, she will become a dry place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken, declares the Lord, and she will become plunder for the nations. Also her daughters who are on the mainland will be killed by the sword, and they will know that I am the Lord. Um, so, so once again, Tyre was uh, famous for its remarkably secure defenses. Um, so, so this prediction of this attack, this, this siege... Um, was, uh, it, despite the city being seemingly unconquerable, um, God promised that one day many nations would, would come against them like the waves of the sea. Continuing on in verse 7. Are we there yet? No. Um, For the Lord says this, Behold, I'm going to bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with his horses, chariots, cavalry, and a great army, um, he will kill your daughters on the mainland with the sword, and he will make siege uh, walls against you, pile up an assault ramp against you, and raise a large shield against you, and he will direct the blow of his battering rams against your walls, and he will tear down your towers with his axes. Because of the multitude of his horses, the dust raised by them will cover you. Your walls will shake from the noise of cavalry, wagons, and chariots. Then he enters your gates as warriors enter a city that is breached. Uh, with the hooves of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your strong pillars will go down to the ground. That is a mighty description. Um, Great. Um, sorry about that. I'm a one-man band today. Um, so, so this is a, a pretty thorough description of siege warfare. Um, the author of this clearly had some knowledge about this. Um, this, this passage was likely written um, ab- around the time that this part of it happened. Um, uh, it was likely written around the time that Nebuchadnezzar was sieging uh, the city of Tyre. Um, so this isn't an incredible prediction necessarily. It may have been uh, written a little before. It may have been uh, written a little after the start of this. Um, so he went on to siege the city for uh, 13 years. But um, this section, verses 7 through 11, are all referring to Nebuchadnezzar saying he. And uh, there's, a, there's a small but significant change that takes place in verse 12. Um, so we'll continue on there. Also, they will take your riches as spoils and plunder your merchandise, tear down your walls and destroy your delightful houses and throw your stones, your timbers and your debris into the water. So I will put an end to the sound of your songs, uh, the sound of your songs and the sound of your harps will no longer be heard. I will turn you into a bare wa- rock and you will become a dry place for the spreading of nets. You will not be rebuilt for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares the Lord. Um, so you probably noticed in verse 12, it switches from he uh, pronouns to they um, signifying that this part will probably not be done by Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, spoiler alert, it wasn't. Um, uh, Other people came later and fulfilled that. Uh, Continuing on in verse 15, uh, the Lord God says this to Tyre, will the coastlands not shake from the sound of your downfall when the wounded groan, when the slaughter takes place in your midst? Then all the priests of the sea will descend from their thrones, remove their robes, and strip off their colorfully woven garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground, tremble again and again, and will be appalled at you. Uh, And they will take up uh, a song of mourning over you and say to you, how you have perished, you inhabited one, from the seas, you famous city, which was mighty on the sea, she and her inhabitants who impose her terror on all her inhabitants inhabitants. Now the coastlands will tremble on the day of your downfall. Yes, the coastlands which are by the sea will be horrified at your passing, uh, for this is what the Lord God says. When I make you a desolate city like the cities which are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you and the great waters cover you, then I will bring you down with those... Already? All right. Um... 
Then I will bring you down with those who go to the uh, pit, to the people of old, and I will make you remain in the lower parts of the earth, like the ancient ruins with those who go down to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited. But I will put glory in the land of the living. I will cause you sudden terrors, and you will no longer exist. Though you will be sought, you will never be found again, declares the Lord. Whew, that was a long passage. Okay. Um, so, so once again, looking back, um, we, see, we see a significant shift. So let's get a little bit into the history and, and what actually happened and how was this fulfilled. So like I said before, Nebuchadnezzar uh, laid siege to Tyre for about 13 years and did conquer the city. So, so all of that took place. Um, everything that was written about Nebuchadnezzar took, took place, and, and Nebuchadnezzar fulfilled that. He brought armies and chariots and horses, and, and the mainland city, important distinction, was, was completely overrun. But because it took 13 years, um, people had, had a lot of time to retreat to uh, other areas or specifically the, the island nearby, and the island was something that Nebuchadnezzar was never able to conquer. The island stood firm, and uh, e- even though he attempted, he was never, never, never able to, to fully uh, conquer and, and break the walls of, of the island. So, so that stayed firm. Uh, he conquered the city. He conquered uh, your daughters uh, on the mainland, so the, the smaller towns around Tyre, all, all of that happened. Um, and then uh, many other um, forces came to Tyre to, to siege them after that. The Persians conquered Tyre uh, and brought Tyre to submission around uh, 525 BC. Uh, Alexander the Great destroyed the city uh, in just the manner described in 33 two, uh, sorry, 332 BC. Uh, Antiochus III uh, conquered and subjugated Tyre, Rome conquered and subjugated Tyre, and finally the Saccharins in the 14th century AD uh, finally obliterated the city of Tyre. Um, this, is, this is after Christ, and, and you'll notice uh, in the scripture that, that uh, Tyre is actually visited and, and ministered to and tried to... Uh, so God give give Tyre another chance to be be redeemed despite their uh, this the sin that that initiated this um, prophecy to to be originally given, which I think is pretty cool. But the the important one here I think for this passage is Alexander the Great and what he did in the city of Tyre. Um, and I will read quickly here verses twelve through fourteen just to refresh. Um, us on on what the prophecy says, what was going to happen several hundred years before it actually did. Also, they will take your riches as spoils and plunder your merchandise, tear down your walls and destroy your delightful houses, and throw your stones and timbers and your debris into the water. So I will put an end to the sound of your songs. But that, but that's the important part. So so that doesn't normally happen in in warfare. Uh, Things aren't, aren't the city will be destroyed and, and put to rubble, but it's not usually thrown into the sea. Um, but in this case, Alexander came to the city of Tyre, um, Alexander the Great, uh, similar to Nebuchadnezzar. He uh, quickly took over the mainland. He, it was probably easier for him because Nebuchadnezzar had already done it. Um, and uh, he di- but he didn't wait to conquer the island. He, he was very early on in his uh, movement uh, that he would go on to, to conquer many lands. This was very early in, in that conquering. Um, so, so what he did is he and his men took the rubble from the city and literally threw it in the water to build a causeway to the island so that they could conquer the island more easily. Which, which is an amazing feat of engineering, but it, but it did happen, and we have a lot of evidence for it. Um, and and, and that's, that's how this, this verse was fulfilled, is, is that it, and it, so, so Alexander the Great went on to conquer the island, and, and the speed and, and ferocity, is that the word, with which he took over Tyre helped him on his campaign going forward, that, that every city he went to after that, they just 
basically, not, not every city, but many of them just gave up because they, they said, I saw what, what he did to Tyre. I don't want that to happen here. Um, so so, so it, was, it was a good strategic move. Um, but but that, that happened to Tyre, and it never recovered. Um, so Alexander the Great set up uh, a city there, but it, it was conquered again and again after, after he was gone. And um, today, it's basically a fishing village. They've built different buildings there. They've, they've, they've put different things there. There's, a, there's another tire that was built uh, somewhere else, not, not the same, but it's not the queen of the seas. You know, it's not the, it's not the, the hub for, for trade, and it, it, it was never the city it, it was before. Um, so, so when in, in verse 14 where it says, I will turn you into a bare rock, you will become a dry place for the spreading of nets, it literally is. It's, it's a fishing village where, where people will lay their nets out and, 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 and none of it was ever recovered. I, with, with some uh, recent excavation, they've been able to find some of it, but it's, it's, it'll never be, be what it once was. Um, I'm saying this because a lot of the objections to this passage is like, well, technically Tyre was rebuilt, you know? It's like, no, when you put, when you put something else in, in the place where, where that once was, it's not, that's not rebuilding, that's just replacing, even if you give it the same name. Um, but one of, the, one of the main objections uh, to this passage is that Nebuchadnezzar didn't fulfill the entire prophecy. That's why I've spent a lot of time on establishing that already. So, so hopefully we have, have the answer is that when in, in verse 3, uh, where it says, I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. I, I looked into these objections a little bit because that seems really clear. Um, and and what they what they said in response to that was, well, Nebuchadnezzar had a really large army, and it was probably cultural. I'm I'm uh, paraphrasing a little bit, but but basically they're saying, well, it was probably culturally diverse, and and Nebuchadnezzar's one army could be described as many nations. And yeah, it could be described as as many nations, and it even is in other places, um, but, but that's clearly not the meaning of the text here. Um, I will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. Um, to me, at least, that, that depicts repeated separate attacks, and even if it was a, an appropriate interpretation, and, and you could kind of say, like, well, maybe it means just Nebuchadnezzar's army, or maybe it means uh, a bunch of different armies will come. W- when you look at history, you can tell which which one it meant. So, um, so, so I don't. Wh- while I don't accept that that's that's a proper interpretation of the text, even if it was, um, we can tell by the fulfillment that that's not what was meant originally. Um, so that that's a really cool passage where where it was written. And then several hundred years later, it was fulfilled. There's no way it was written after it was fulfilled. It's really specific, and, and, and this is just a really, really awesome passage. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on here because, because we have a lot, of, a lot to get to today. But are there any questions about, about this uh, portion specifically before, I'm, before I move on? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so we're looking at at prophecy today to prove to prove scripture because of the reasons we looked at earlier, right? Um, and I can pull up the slide. Uh, it proves the messages from God. It guarantees the rest of God's promises. I'm object, I'm ab- addressing the objections because they come up. So if you're if you're thinking about you know the prophecy of this specific prophecy, um, you'll you, these are objections you may hear. It's like, well, that's not actually fulfilled prophecy. That's actually an example of of God failing uh, to fulfill prophecy. Um, so 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 I'm addressing those because they come up. Um, was that was that a sufficient answer? Okay. Um, any other? Yeah. 
So it's now a peninsula because, because he built a causeway and it's filled with sediment. Um, so it's there, but it's, it's all just kind of one landmass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really cool, cool thing, and we can still see today the, the physical evidence of it being fulfilled. Um, so let's move on. Uh, we're going to do Psalm 22 now. This is a, a messianic prophecy, um, which is cool. So, so again, a little background um, while you turn there in your Bibles. So this was written by King David. Um, it was written in about the 10th century BC, so that's a thousand years before Jesus was born. Um, there was uh, the, the main Jewish inter- interpretation of this passage was that it was a messianic prophecy be- before Jesus. The main interpretation was that it was a messianic prophecy. All other Jewish interpretations, uh, or, or may- maybe there's some I haven't heard of, but other in- Jewish interpretations uh, require that the passage be separated uh, verse by f- verse and applied to a bunch of different people. Uh, Jesus is the only person that the entire passage could be applied to, um, and the passage definitely couldn't have been applied to David himself. Uh, no known event from his life comes anywhere close to anything that's described in this passage. Um, and the first person to apply this passage to being out about Jesus was actually Jesus. Um, so in Matthew uh, 27, 46, um, it says, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, sorry if I butchered that, uh, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, so let's continue on in uh, Psalm 22, starting in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my help are the words of my groaning. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. You who are, unthro- who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted you and you rescued them. To you they cried out and they fled to safety. In you they trusted and they were not disappointed. So this section here, um, it shows someone, someone in agony, someone crying out to God, but not rejecting God, not, not uh, re- refusing God, not, not, not saying he's not good in, in, in any way, um, still affirming God's, God's authority and, and his goodness. Um, and, and we'll continue in verse 6. Uh, but I am a worm and not a person, a discreet... Okay. Uh, but I'm a worm and not a person, a disgrace of mankind and despised by the people. All who see me deride me. They sneer and shake their heads saying, turn him over to the Lord. Let him save him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. The fulfillment of this came in uh, or is written about in Matthew 27, 39. And I'll read that now. Uh, and those passing by were speaking abusively to him. This is obviously about, about Jesus and his... Uh, um, crucifixion. Uh, and those that were passing by were speaking abusively to him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and uh, we will believe him. He is trusted in God. Let God rescue him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the son of God. And uh, the rebels who who had been crucified with him were also insulting him in the same way. So they sneer, they shake their heads saying, uh, turn him over the Lord. All this this was fulfilled and and is written about in Matthew there uh, in Jesus. We'll continue on in verse nine. Do I need to change it yet? Nope. Two more verses. Uh, Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. Uh, You made me trust when upon my mother's breast I was cast cast upon you from birth. You have been my God from my mother's room. Do not be far from me. 
for my trouble is near, for there is no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open their mouths wide at me as a ravening and roaring lion. So, so bulls in this section uh, refers to powerful people. Um, we see examples of this in Caiaphas, the chief priests, uh, the Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod. Um, all of these really powerful people in the area were, were surrounding uh, Jesus uh, to, to um, crucify him for that, for that purpose. Um, continuing in verse 14, I am poured out like water, uh, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is melted like like wax. It is melted within me. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a piece of pottery, and my tongue clings to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. And we'll stop there. So this this description um, really accurately describes crucifixion. Um, so in verse 14 which is back. Um, all my bones are out of joint. So, so w- when someone was crucified, Roman crucifixion, um, they, they were hanging from their, their wrists and, and they, their, all their bones were being pulled out uh, from their chest. So, so it was impossible to breathe uh, without, without lifting themselves up. Um, so, so what Jesus had to do on the cross is he had to push up on that nail to to take a breath, and that's why breaking the shins would um, would kill someone was is because they would die from suffocation. Um, so so this description of being poured out like water, um, Jesus's blood was was poured out all over Jerusalem. He was beaten at at every trial he went to. Um, uh, Chi- the trial with Chi- he had at least three. The trial with Caiaphas, uh, the trial in front of the Sanhedrin, uh, or, or the at Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, the trial in front of Pilate, in front of Herod, and he was being taken to all these different places, and his b- blood was pouring out all over Jerusalem, which I think is is really amazing imagery that uh, his his blood is is for all of us. Um, he, his, his blood and water poured out when, when he was stabbed with the spear in his side. Um, Jesus wept blood in the, in the garden, which is a real condition, um, by the way. Um, it's, it's commonly seen in death row inmates, which I think is interesting. Um, and, uh, my heart is melted. Uh, my heart is like wax. It is melted within me. Um, my strength is dried up like a piece of pottery. This could uh, be referring to uh, pronunciation hypovolemic shock. Uh, this is the shock that you go into when uh, when you're from blood loss and uh, dehydration. My tongue clings to my jaws. So these were all things that Jesus was going through. Um, so th- so this is a really accurate description of. Um, Roman crucifixion, and there's more here, starting in verse 16. Uh, For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me, they pierced my hands and feet, I can count all my bones, they look and stare at me. Um, Yeah, so just that section, they pierced my hands and my feet, which we'll get to the objection about that in a minute. It's it's a nothing burger. Um, (laughs) But, uh, (laughs) but, Spoilers, um, but uh, dogs have surrounded me. So this de- refers to despicable people. Uh, so so strong bulls refers to powerful people. Um, dogs refers to despicable people. So this could uh, be be talking about public execution, um, the people who are uh, jeering him and 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 ridiculing him. Um, and uh, so, so this is a, a description. David's describing Roman crucifixion 600 years before it was ever used. Um, we have no record of crucifixion and, until at least the 4th century BC, and it wasn't, wasn't widely used until the 1st century BC, about 100 years before, before Jesus was executed that way. So they'd gotten really good at it by then. Um, Continuing on in verse 18, um, they divide my garments among them and they cast lots for my clothing. So that's interesting. They, div- they divide my garments and they also cast lots. 
That normally wouldn't happen. Normally, they would either just divide them among themselves, or, or they would cast lots, and somebody would get them. Um, but if we look at John 19, 23 uh, through 24, we can see why that, that took place. Um, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments uh, and made four parts, a part to each soldier, and the tunic also, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. Uh, this happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. They divided my garments among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. Clothing. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Um, so that's, that's really cool. That's a, that's a, a, a direct description of, of what happened. And um, when, when these things were being written, there were still people around who were there when these things happened. So if... They, if those things hadn't happened, if they were just making them up, they, they would, th that would have been addressed. People would have been saying that that never happened. You're just, you're just making this up to, to fulfill the, uh, the, the prophecies about the Messiah. Um, but that, but we don't, we don't have any examples of that. So, so it probably did happen. Um, continuing on in verse 19. Uh, but you, Lord, do not be far away. You who are my help, hurry to my assistance. Save my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen. You answer me. So this is a plea for deliverance, which Jesus, Jesus did um, make that plea in the, in the, the garden. Um, but with this phrase, these last three words, um, are they up there? You answer me. Yes. Uh, from the hordes of the wild oxen, you answer me. With this phrase, the whole passage shifts. Um, so it shifts from the present tense to the future tense, and, uh, and, and it shifts to a message of deliverance. Um, which is really cool. He, when Jesus talked about his death, he always talked about his resurrection with it. Um, whenever he talked about his death, he talked about his resurrection. Those things were, were almost always together. Um, so so let's, let's continue on in this. And, um, and also, this being future tense, we can definitely know that this is prophecy um, with it shifting to the future tense. Some some objections will say, well, this isn't prophecy. This is just describing something in someone else's life that had already happened. No, this is definitely prophecy. So let's continue on in verse 22, and I'll need to switch it at verse 23. Um, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor scorns, scorned the suffering of the afflicted. So this is specifically describing Jewish people, right? Um, uh, in the midst of uh, fear the Lord, uh, all you descendants of Jacob, uh, descendants of Israel. Uh, so this is talking about, about the Jewish people. Um, and continuing on, nor has he hidden his face from him, uh, but when he cried to him for help, he heard from you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows uh, before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisf satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. Do I need to switch yet? Probably, right? Yeah. Do I need to switch again? Have I gone past it? Okay. <laughs> will worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship, and all those who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, a posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord of the coming generation. Uh, they will come and will declare his righteousness to all people who will be born uh, that he has performed it. That's amazing. So, so it goes from talking about the Jewish people to talking about all the ends of the earth, all these people coming together under this, this one event, this one event that was described in the first half of, of 
Psalm 22, um, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And where, where, is it, where is anything else like, like this happen? What has brought Jews and Gentiles together under one event all over the world? Nothing, nothing but Jesus has done anything like this. And that's, that's just, this is such an amazing, amazing messianic prophecy, amazing passage that, that so clearly sh- shows who, who Messiah is. And I just think that's, that's really, really wonderful. Um, and, and on that, talking, talking about Jesus, I want to, uh, amazing transition, um, I want to get into some of the statistics about um, Messianic prophecy specifically, because this is just one passage um, with maybe like 15 different, different prophecies in it. But there are over 300 Messianic prophecies and Jesus fulfilled all of them. So, so Peter, uh, Professor Peter Stoner uh, did some math. Thank, thank, be thankful that he did it because, because I'm no good at math. So um, this is peer-reviewed and, and, and uh, well-done math, uh, as, as far as I know, um, about the chances of someone fulfilling just a few of these, these passages. So he took eight prophecies... Um, about Jesus, and he put n- numbers to each of them, basically saying, like, this has a one in 1,000 chance of happening to someone. Uh, and and I've, I've, looking at some of them, I felt like he gave very conservative numbers. For instance, for rising from the dead, he gave it a one in 100,000 chance, which... <laughs> Um, I've never met anybody who's risen from the dead. I've never heard of anybody other than Jesus um, and Lazarus, right? Um, but, but yeah, so, so he gave that a little better chance than I probably would have. Um, but for just eight of these prophecies, um, he, he gave... So the chances of someone fulfilling eight of the prophecies found in the Old Testament would be about one in 10 to the 17th power. Um, so, so about one in a hundred quadrillion, that's, that's a one followed by 17 zeros, which looks like this. Um, and he gave, uh, some, some imagery to, to help us understand because that's, that's an unfathomable number. We, it would be, it's incredibly difficult to understand how big that number is. So, so he said, we take, uh, 10 to the 17 silver dollars was the, the image he gave, uh, and we lay them on the face of Texas. So we lay them over the face of Texas. They will cover the state two feet deep. So if we had, if we had that number of sil- silver dollars laid over the entire state of Texas, they would cover the state two feet deep. Um, so now we mark one of these, these silver dollars, stir the whole mass thoroughly, blindfold a man, and tell them that he must pick up, up one silver dollar and say that it is the right one, what chance would he have of getting the right one? Well, one in a hundred quadrillion, right? Um, so, so that's amazing, but that's only eight prophecies, right? There are over 300. Um, but, it, but it does show something. So, so he goes on to write later in his book, just the same chance that the prophets would have of writing just eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man um, from their day to represent, uh, to, sorry, from their day to present time, providing uh, they wrote in their own wisdom. So these would be the chances if they weren't getting help from God. Um, this means that the, the fulfillment of just eight prophecies alone proves that God inspired the writing of those eight prophecies uh, to, um, to a, def- a definiteness which lacks only one chance in 10 to the 17 of being absolute. So, so the, the, these are the chances that, that they were helped, essentially. Um, but he goes on. He goes on to calculate 48 prophecies. And once again, let's remember that there are over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Um, but, but I think this is certainly sufficient to prove the case. And, and, and as he just said, this is proving the case not only for Jesus, 
but for the prophets who wrote the scriptures. It works in both directions. If, they, if these are the chances of someone fulfilling it, these are the chances of someone being able to write it. Um, so the chances of someone fulfilling 48 of the prophecies found in the Old Testament would be 1 in 10 to the 157th power, which, again, just completely unfathomable. This is what the number looks like. One in 10, so one followed by 157 zeros. This is what the number looks like if I counted correctly. Um, but <laughs> but um, so, so this, I'm, I'm going to attempt to, to put this in, into a, a place where we can try to understand how big this number for just 48 of these prophecies. So, so we have the silver dollars. Well, of 10, 10 to the 17, right, um, covering Texas. So if we stack those five miles high instead and then went around the entire Earth, now we've gotten to 10 to the 25th power, okay? So, so not, not even close, not even close to the number. Um, so that, but, but it's... This is important information because that is about the number of atoms that exist in a one by one by one block of iron. So, so if you can picture five miles all the way around the world being pushed into a one inch block, that's, so that's 10 to the 25. Now we're going to try to get to 10 to the 157th in atoms. Okay? So... How much space would we need for 10 to the 157? Um, not just our entire world of atoms, not just our solar system or our galaxy, or even just our observable universe. We would need four and a half universes to hold all the atoms in, in the density of iron. So picture a block of iron the size of four and a half of our observable universe you know, I feel like we don't even have to put the blindfold on the guy. I don't, I don't think he's going to be able to find that, Adam. <laughs> it's, 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 we're, we're, we're looking for something unfathomably small in something unfathomably big. It's ridiculous. The chances here, these, these numbers are so extreme. If we let people try for these 48 prophecies every second for, for 5 billion years, everybody on earth, without sleep, for 5 billion years until the sun explodes, they wouldn't even get to Saturn before they had looked, looked through all these atoms. It's, it's, it's an incredible, incredible number um, that, that just, just is not, not, not possible to, to fathom. So... So, so, so some people will say, well, what if, well, I don't think Jesus fulfilled any of these prophecies. I don't, I don't even know if Jesus existed. Um, while we don't have time to get into every piece of evidence for the resurrection, I, I am just going to give you a few of the minimal facts. These are things that, um, that s scholars and historians all agree on believer and skeptic. Um, so, so one is Jesus did die by crucifixion. That's absolutely certain in history. His disciples had experiences that they believed were the risen Jesus, um, and their lives were trans transformed as a result of that, even to the point of being willing to die specifically for their faith in the resurrection message. So, so these men believed in it so thoroughly that they were willing to die for it. This is, this is established history. This definitely happened. Um, I'll, I'll give an example of w one of Paul's writings, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. Um, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the den, dead, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, 
We are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he, didn't, uh, but, did he, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are uh, of all people most to be pitied. So, so Paul took this really, really seriously. This is, uh, he's making it very clear that this is the most important fact about Christianity, is, if, is, is Christ rising from the dead and establishing who he is. Um, so, so they were very serious about this, and it's, it's well documented that they believed this. Um, it was pro- proclaimed very early. Uh, you can re- track the resurrection preaching to immediately after the cross. This is well established and accepted. Uh, and James and Paul became uh, Christians because of the experience they believed were the resurrected Jesus. So James uh, was Jesus's brother. Um, he was not a believer in Christ, but he knew him very well. So it's reasonable to think that he would know if his brother had come back or not. And Paul was not only not a believer, but he was an enemy of the church. He was murdering Christians. That was his entire job, was just to go out and persecute Christians. Um, and he had an experience of the risen, risen Jesus, which, which changed his mind. Um, these, are, these are very brief, minimal facts. This is not uh, a comprehensive um, uh, proof of Jesus' resurrection, but I do think it is enough to, to prove it. I think on those alone, uh, you, you can prove Jesus' resurrection. Um, and and there's, there's so much information about this topic alone that, that we may, at, at some point, um, do a whole series just on this. Um, we've, we've talked about. So um, while, while we don't have time to go, to go further today, um, uh, I, th- I think that that shows, you know, just, just looking at the, the numbers, again, this is still, still on the screen, uh, if, if he put, fulfilled just 48 of these, not even all 300, plus more than 300, um, that these are the numbers. And it's just, it's absolutely impossible that anyone could even intentionally make that happen. Um, so, We've only looked at a couple today, but there are hundreds and hundreds of fulfilled prophecies, not just about Jesus, but about many other topics in the Bible. At the time it was written, about a third of Scripture was prophecy. Um, And uh, each one of these is further evidence um, that the messages from God, all of God's promises have or will be fulfilled and the Bible is unlike any other religious book. Um, I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, we, we read earlier, Matthew 4.4, 4, um, man shall not live alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Um, it, is, it is amazing to know that we have this, this work. Uh, that that God has given us, that it's true and that it's right, at least in its original form, that what he gave us originally was was perfect and was from him. Um, and and we should study it and we should we should dig into it. Um, all scripture is breathed out by God, and every word of God proves true because it is impossible for God to lie. Jesus is who he said he what who he said he is. He did what he said he was going to do, and he affirmed the scripture, and, and the scripture affirms itself. And that's, that's not all the, all the evidence we have. That's not, that's not the end of the story. We have, we have so much to look at. Um, it, it's it's so, so clear that scripture is true, um, at least in its original form, right? So next week, we're going to be looking at uh, the manuscripts and, and how they were maintained, if, if they were uh, kept 
uh, close to their their original form. Um, if 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 we have today what was originally written, if we can even know what if we can know what was originally written, if we can know if we know what was originally written, um, and we're also going to be looking at uh, some English translations and and has has the Bible been faithfully translated? Does it does does our English translation? Uh, come anywhere close to, to what was originally written, or, or is what we have in our hands today? I should have should have brought a Bible, but um, but is what we have in our hands is that is that the scriptures, or is it just something else entirely? Um, but for this week, we will close there, um, and and I'll I'll open it up to to questions or or comments. Uh, if anyone if anyone has any, if anyone wants to add anything or or correct me on anything, hopefully not. But, uh, yeah. On a point you made earlier, just about all atheists today, mm-hmm. there are some that are still but very well-known atheists mm-hmm. don't even begin to deny the existence. Right, yeah. And they don't begin to deny that he was crucified. Mm-hmm. Now, the resurrection the, part... Now, now I will say I, I I don't think that you're correct in saying that that most atheists don't deny that, but I I, I think you're you would be correct to say most educated atheists, most atheist scholars, um, um will won't will 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 not say that. So so anyone who's who's looked into the history or anyone who's who's done it, but people for some reason people still say that's an argument people will bring up is well I don't I, I don't even know if Jesus existed. Your average everyday atheist on the street, um, which is a, which is a ridiculous argument because because no serious person believes that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So you already have that going in. Of course, the resurrection yeah. part is where the... I cut it for time, but but that was in the original <laughs> version of this of this message. Um, yeah, I had, a, I had a cool quote from Gary Habermas, but I I cut it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. Interesting. Yeah. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Any questions, comments? Yeah. His name is uh, Professor Peter W. Stoner, and his book is called Science Speaks, where he where he talks about this. Yeah, Stoner, the 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 marijuana expert. Yep, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> awesome. Well, if there well if there aren't any more, um, let's uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today to to talk about this amazing topic of of your your work. Uh, your 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 word that you, that you've brought to earth in in the form of Jesus in the form of this text the words that you've given to to people here on earth to write um, thank you for giving us so much evidence and so much clarity that this work is true and that it's that it's from you and that we can trust it God and and I just ask that that we would hide this in our hearts that we would that we would 
dig into the scripture and that we would love the scripture and 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 come to know you better by by studying god allow us to to come away from this place with with an invigorated and with with an energy to to study your scriptures god thank you for getting me through this um and and Lord, I just ask that this would be a, a blessing. Um, it has definitely been a blessing for me, and, and I hope it's a blessing for other people as we go out from here. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.